good morning. Good morning. Mm -hmm. So we've, we've had someone that uh, has stayed a couple nights with us here and has been in and out a bit. And uh, she went out to Adelanto, and for those of you that are listening to this in Houston, Texas, Adelanto is a town that's about 45 minutes away from us. It's a little tiny town like our town. And they have uh, a large temple complex there that uh, is uh, vying to be the Disneyland of the desert because the statues are so huge and overwhelming. And so this lady went out there uh, and participated in a class that they offered in English. And uh, when she came here, that was her first exposure to Buddhism. And when she came here, she was looking for meditation to help her with her life. Um, right off the bat, she said to me as I was talking to her, well, you know, he made this statement about that uh, nothing is real. And uh, she said, I was fascinated by that statement. What, what did that mean? Nothing is real. And I thought, oh yeah, this would just be a great conversation to have with someone that knows zero about Buddhism. And, uh, and where would we go with that? But we have mostly to, today, we have one new person, one guest here, who may or may not know nothing about Buddhism. So I'll just talk about nothing is real so I can completely confuse her. <laughs> And then, of course, she'll come back occasionally to find out, what was he talking about? Okay, there's a, we like to tell stories in the practice of Zen. Uh, we tell stories in Buddhism, but we really like stories in Zen because the absolute truth is very t difficult to approach head on. Uh, we, we tend to have to kind of go around to the side and sneak up on it in order to understand what's going on. So I'll start off this talk with uh, one of my favorite stories that I've, I'm sure I've overused it over the years. If anybody were foolish enough or had nothing but time on their hands, because we have, it's estimated, seven years worth of talks on the website. So I can't imagine anybody actually listening to all those talks. <clears throat> there was once a monk uh, who was traveling with his master and they were going from one place to another, or one temple to another. And monks used to do a lot of traveling. Uh, just remember that the country was basically a Buddhist country, so there were temples spread out through the countryside and through the cities. And the monk could go for a walk, and uh, you know, walk half the day and come up upon a temple, and they would let him stay overnight at the temple. That was common courtesy. And there were, there were even, it was so common that there were rules about how long he could stay before he had to actually go outside and sweep the walkway and, and start taking some responsibility. So this monk and his master were walking along a pathway and um, they came up upon a stream with fresh water. So the master said, well, this looks like a good place for us to stop for the day. And we can uh, maybe make a little fire, cook a little dinner, uh, we have fresh water here. And so they stopped. And shortly after that, coming in the opposite direction was another monk and his master. Now, the first monk and his master were typical Chan or Zen monks of the time. And so they had fairly well-worn robes. They, uh, it was obvious they'd been around for a while. They might have been a little bit on the dirty side. Although monks are famous for actually being pretty clean. And I, I met a monk the other day that was dirty, and I, I just couldn't get over it. I'd never really met a dirty monk before. And um, I wasn't his teacher, but if I was his teacher, I would have told him, go wash your clothes and take a bath. Because that's what the Buddha told his disciples to do. You need to make a nice presentation. So these two monks were there, and they were heating up something, probably some porridge. And uh, the other two monks arrived, and boy, they had nice robes. Even the disciple had very nice robes, military crease in them. The color was nice and solid. It hadn't been washed too many times. And the master, oh, he had fancy brocaded robes on. Might even have been wearing a fancy hat because, you know, I think Americans are all familiar with the Tibetans now, and if they've got one thing going for them, it's those big hats. 
class. I mean, I really need one of those for when we do processions. Susan's shaking her head no. Man, those big old hats, I don't know how they don't, you know, they must have the strongest necks in the whole world wearing those hats. And so they showed up. And uh, they, you know, they kind of bowed to each other and nodded to each other. And, and so they uh, laid out uh, like a blanket so they had some place to sleep. And they, it's okay if we share your fire, of course. And so they started cooking up their porridge. Uh, and as time went along, the two disciples began to talk. And the Zen disciple said, uh, oh, your master has wonderful robes. You got pretty nice ones yourself, and, and uh, the disciple of the master of, of nice robes said, "Well, you know, he's a very important person. Oh yes, he's known all over the land. He's such an important person, and uh, people give him these wonderful robes to wear. And uh, he really doesn't have any everyday type of robes. I see your master; he just has. Is he like a really low-ranking monk?" I was asked that one time by, about my teacher. I was at ZCLA and they said, so what is he? Is he like a really low-ranking monk? Mm -hmm. And all I could do was laugh. But uh, this young disciple said, well, no, he's a, he's a Zen master. Well, and the, the well-dressed monk said, oh, yeah, well, okay, fine. So he's got a title, but he probably doesn't know much of anything. Zen monk said, so what is it your master knows? He says, oh, he can do magic. He can do all kinds of magic. He can, he can fly through the sky when he feels like it. And he can touch people on their heels. And he knows all the secret words to use to open all the secrets of the universe. And he said to the young Zen monk, he said, so what can your teacher do? And the young Zen monk said, not much. All he's capable of doing is eating when he's hungry, using the toilet when it's time, and sleeping when he's tired. And of course, the fancy dress monk didn't get it at all. But good Zen students do, because I see a lot of nodding heads and smiles. And that is the way, that's the practice. So what is this about nothing really exists? Well, at what, ang what angle do we want to come at this? I love science because when I was a high school teacher, I used to explain to my students that if we were going to talk about an atom, the most basic of all matter, and I was the nucleus, my electrons would be way out on the street. We had a big campus, way out on the street. And they'd be circling me. And I'd say, so if I'm the nucleus and people that study atoms know that the nucleus is the only thing that really has any mass, I'm hitting nucleuses. I'm not hitting electrons because electrons uh, you know, physicists say they basically don't have any mass. Well, they have a mass, but it's so teeny, teeny, tiny that for all intents and purposes, it doesn't count. It's like talking about the mass of air. I'm grabbing big chunks of air in here because it has so much mass. Well, that's the way the electrons are. And I tell my students, I say, okay, so an atom is primarily made up of what? If I'm the nucleus, and way out there on the road is my first electron. What's in between the electron and me? Space, emptiness. There's nothing there. So when we say that life is illusionary, now I'm using a different word. I'm not saying that it doesn't exist because I think that monk fell into a trap. But maybe not. Maybe that's what the word he wanted to use. But it's very illusionary, this idea of solidness. Science tells us that solidness is just, it's kind of con a convenience, it's a convention. Now, if this didn't have the appearance of solidness, what I'm sitting on, then I would fall to the floor, which would only have the appearance of solidness, and I would go straight through to the earth, which only, you know, see where we're going with this, 
and then I just keep falling off into the universe and never to stop. So we have something we chant on a regular basis. It's called the Relative and the Absolute, written by the third patriarch of Zen, or the second, I never can remember. But one of those guys at New Bodhidharma wrote this, the Relative and the Absolute. And what's relative is our perception of the world around us. And everybody, if you talk to them, they'll say, well, of course, of course, this is solid. What, what, are you a crazy person? You don't understand this is solid? Until you start understanding physics that there's mostly space there. So that's one way of looking at this problem of it's an illusion. Or if you want to say it's not really real. I don't like not really real because not really real implies there's nothing real. And if you believe that, I don't have an awakening stick here. If I did, I'd run over and hit you with it. And then you could tell me about how unreal it was as you were going, ouch, why did you do that to me? So there's a relativeness about things. It's like people thinking, you know, if you ask a child, what's out here? And they go, what are you talking about? They said, well, isn't there air? And of course, most children know about air. They go, well, yeah, there's air. So, uh, you know, uh, how much air is there? Well, you know, air is... And when you get, you get done talking, the child would tell you, well, air is really more of an idea than it's a thing. Because it really doesn't have any mass. child wouldn't know the word mass. But they'd say it's not really stuff. And yet, we know it's stuff. Because we can go places where there is no stuff. There's no stuff on, on the moon. If you take your fancy helmet off and inhale, that's your last breath because there's nothing to inhale. So air is real, but air is really, really different than this thing right here. This is so unreal that if I hit it, it'll start to vibrate. And when it vibrates, it'll cause the air to vibrate. And the vibrating air will hit our ear, which really doesn't exist. And it'll make a sound. We have Susan and Mary here, and I don't know about the rest of you guys, but I know the two of them are fabulous singers, and so it'll hit their sound ear when the guitar is playing, and they'll start to sing songs, and they'll start to modulate air that comes out over these two little things in their throat that vibrate, and all of this, but none of that is real. There's a school within Buddhism that began in China that talked about mind only. That's, that's the English way to talk about the school. The Yogacara school was the mind only school. And that the mind created all things. And the, in no way is that wrong. But to say that there is nothing that is real is to miss the point of the mind only school. Okay, the mind only school could say to you, you know, humans have a concept that there are ugly people, there are homely people, which by the way are not the same thing, and there are very attractive people. And everybody in the audience, I watched this funny thing last night, I don't know if I can work it into the talk today, but it was a 60 year old lady who was doctor so and so, I don't know a doctor of what, explaining that aging didn't really happen. Kind of a mind-only school person, telling everybody that aging does not happen, that it's all in the mind. And I, I felt like telling that lady, would you come and talk to Rob and I about our knees? <laughs> tell, tell, tell us, tell me I don't have arthritis in this knee. You can tell me I shouldn't obsess over it, but. I'm not sure that I'm going to buy the idea that I don't have arthritis in this knee right here. And, uh, and I know Rob is not going to buy the idea that nothing's going on with his knee. But uh, a lot of what she said was really good. I'll come back to that later because uh, I just have to share with you, or maybe when we have lunch after this talk is over with. Um, so we have these three people, and this is perception. And when we do the Heart Sutra, every time we get together, we're talking about perception. And 
we're our own worst enemy because we start talking about beautiful and ugly and I don't know what we call homely. Normal? Every day? What's in? Plain. Plain. Mm -hmm. Plain. Yeah, okay. I like plain. That's good. Yeah, so we got beautiful, ugly, and plain. There's a woman, I've, I've started doing Tai Chi because I don't believe in old age. <laughs> <laughs> and there's this woman that comes, and she's a little bitty thing, and uh, married to a, a guy that comes who's not a little bitty thing. And uh, she came three or four times, and I saw her, and I thought, gosh, she's tiny. She's tinier than Mary is tiny. Just, you know what I'm talking about, that little bitty yeah. lady. And I had no sense of who this lady was. And, and I'm a firm belief that you cannot make any kind of rational judgment about anybody. Anybody. Because we're back to that mind-only school. Are they ugly? Are they beautiful? Are they plain? And what does that have to do with who they are? Okay, and that's what this whole nothing's real thing is about. And then a couple weeks ago she came and somebody said something to her and I was so curious, but I didn't ask. They said, oh, I read that article you wrote. And this woman lit up like a candle. All of a sudden she was smiling her whole body language, which I didn't realize how protective it was until she relaxed. And she relaxed and she turned to this person and she smiled and she said something like that. God, she's beautiful. But until that moment she was playing. I have a, a firm belief that I've had most of my adult life that all people are beautiful if they smile. And many people are ugly when they don't. And so this is so conditional. So how do we measure it? We can't measure it for magazines. We really can't because they have nothing to do with reality. They are imagined reality. And any, any woman that ever tries to go buy a dress that a model wore will tell you that nobody in there, nobody can wear those dresses. You have to starve yourself to death to get into those dresses. You know, these, these people that are that big around. Okay, so they're kind of a manufactured reality. So that's one way of looking at things. It's very, very conditional. And that's what the, 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 the chant, the sutra we do called the relative and the absolute which was actually a poem, technically, except that any time a Buddha talks, it's a sutra, and the third patriarch was enlightened, or he wouldn't be the third patriarch, therefore we get to call that a sutra. See how I did that? I manipulated reality right there. So that's one way of looking at things aren't real, but they're very, very conditional. Rock out there is beginning of the path. That's absolute. It doesn't care what you think about it. It doesn't care whether you think it's beautiful or it's ugly or it's plain. Okay? It doesn't care whether you think it's special or mundane. Because when you're not paying attention and you run into that with your bare toes because you're wearing sandals, you have encountered the absolute. The state of that rock doesn't care whether you understand atoms. It doesn't care whether you understand that the universe is made up of vibrations. It doesn't care about any of that stuff. It just said hello to your toes. And because it's a rock, it doesn't even care that you kicked it. Because you lost. Very few people can kick rocks and win. So that's our absolute state. But then we get into our this constant state of conditional things. And I usually have a fish here. I don't have a fish. So I'll use this cushion because this cushion's got shapes and colors. And so as I turn this cushion, you can see that it's got red pieces in it, kind of triangular. And then it's got this white area with, with design in it, which looks like a flower to me. And then it's got this little fuzzy thing they put in the center. I always like it when people that make things so things do that because you don't need that fuzzy thing you could just put some thread through there and that would serve the purpose 
but an artist worked on this and they realized how pleasing that little fuzzy thing is to, uh, to our eye. Okay, but then if we turn it this way, we get such a different shape. And as we rotate it, it feels like things keep changing. And then when I tilt it this way, everything starts changing again. And if I do this to it, okay, so what is the nature of this cushion other than it's always changing? Okay. That's part of the problem, if we perceive it as a problem. <coughs> Another part of this issue is, is who's right? Because when I hold this up, those guys over there see one thing, and they absolutely do not see what you see. And Mary's sitting at an angle. Sandy's way over there. She's got. She's like. She's looking on the edge of a donut. I've got to come around here to get a feeling for what she's got. And Eric over there, the the view changes depending on where you're sitting, how far away you're sitting, how good your eyesight is, and the thing that always, because some people who knew me a long time ago knew that I had one eye that used to go wandering off on its own, and the other one would look at what I was doing, and it always, I, I, I never could understand my high school students would say, what eye are you looking at me with? I'm going, this one's looking over there, and this one's looking at you. How can you not know which eye I'm looking at you with? But I wouldn't say that. I'd go, yes, I'm looking at you. Now, put that away and pay attention. So we have all these different views of this thing. Which one is right? All of them. I like that. That's a good answer. All of them is a good answer. That's not what we do in life. Mary has made a career of getting two or more people to sit down and talk about what they think they know and what they think they see. And her profession is to get them to move closer to understanding what's happening. I won't say to see the same thing. Because I don't think that ever happens. But they, they get closer to some kind of agreement about what's going on. Maybe it's no more than to agree that this is actually a cushion and not, I'm getting hungry right now. And you know, I miss it. You remember when your dad used to bring donuts all the time? <laughs> Do you know what I'm addicted to? <laughs> Do you know I cannot stop at a donut shop now because it just it got out of hand? <laughs> I used to go to work in the morning, and every morning I'd get a cup of coffee and a cinnamon roll. And, and, and I had a friend go, you do know that's why you're gaining weight, don't you? <laughs> no, no, couldn't be, couldn't possibly be. Because it has all, of, like Bill Cosby used to say, it's all the food groups. <laughs> so everything has to be okay. So just moving towards some kind of agreement, it is a cushion. That's a lot better than, I don't see what you see at all. So you have to be wrong. We have a terrible time understanding that other people may see better than us, or hear better than us, or understand better than us. It is so difficult, and it's also very normal. You know, we are the center of the universe. I want you to remember back to when you were in your mom. Only Buddhists can do that, but I'm going to pretend that you're a fully actualized Buddha and that you were in there and your mom was a wonderful person who listened to music because she read an article by Dr. Spock who said if you play music for your baby every day, your baby will respond to it. And if you've ever talked to a mother that had a child that played music, They'll tell you the baby does respond to the music. They start moving around in there in time, Susan. They really do. I know it sounded like woo-woo stuff when Spock said it, but the reality is all things that live respond to vibrations, and music is certainly wonderful vibrations. So 
So how do we get people to see that they see things differently? I started to talk about my eyes. I've been acutely aware because I had, I had the less common condition with my eyes that I could focus either one, which meant that I could tell that there was a difference in the color perception of my eyes. And I always knew this as a kid. I thought everybody was like that. Until one day I started teaching Zen and I made people close an eye. Well, you know, the first thing that surprised me is that I knew someone who got something in their eye and they had to wear a patch. And they, they were really scared to drive because their whole world changed by closing that one eye. And I can remember hearing things about people that had lost an eye in an accident and how they had to relearn how to see. And I, I couldn't get it because I could look at you with my left eye or I could look at you with my right eye. And for those who are wondering what I'm talking about, a few years ago I had my eyes operated on because they got so bad that they confused me. And I had two operations and now they pretty much look in the same direction, which is cool. <laughs> yeah. And I can even do another thing, you know, if I'm really feeling mushy about Susan, I can go ahead and see her twice. I'm doing it right now. <laughs> Oh, the control I have is mind-boggling. <laughs> so somebody could come along and say, well, are there really two Susans? And I go, well, there are to me because I can see two Susans. Therefore, there are to the entire world. And babies and their mom, everything is about them. They hear the music, and that's their world. They hear the heartbeat. Do you know why they take a baby and put it on their mom's chest when the baby's born? So it will continue to hear the heartbeat, because that is the baby's world. And when you separate them from that sound, it's, it's drastic. That's not why they cry when they're born. They cry because the, that doggone operating room is cold. That's why they cry. And they've been so comfortable for nine whole months. And all of a sudden, they've got the biggest goose bump you've ever seen because someone puts them out into that. And the whole of the universe is about you or me. And everything, everything we see is coming in this way. As I look out, everything's coming to me. It's very hard to realize that there's somebody else that's just as important as you. And that's part of the reason why people argue. In college, when I took public speaking, I had a young man. I, it was funny. For freshman comp, I had a very a guy just out of college. And his buddy was the public speaking teacher, and he was just out of college. So they had a very different way of looking at things. And the first thing they said the first day was, nine out of ten arguments are verbal arguments. And everybody went, well, yeah. What? And the tenth one, you're pounding on each other, right? Bloody noses and all that. No. He said, no, that's not what it means. It means that you probably agree, you just don't know that you agree because the language you're using. You're using slightly different language. So here you are getting really mad at each other, and yet you don't disagree. That's hard for, I never forgot that. See, I've been a Buddhist a long time trying to figure out why am I so deluded. So when I saw that, because I used to love to argue, I still love to argue, but not Mary, you can't believe what I was like. People would run when they'd see me coming. <laughs> and they go, oh, there he is again. No, we don't need any more of that. So that whole thing, this constant thing of seeing things differently that all people do. And what are we going to do about it? Well, the first thing is to learn that we see things differently. And the second thing, you know, the, in, in Japanese Buddhism, it's the only Buddhism I know of that has a precept not to get angry. I don't know how anybody keeps that precept. How do you not get angry when you smash your thumb with your hammer when you're driving the nail and you go, Gah! how do you do that? It's, it's totally, completely an ideal. But ideals are good because that's what our precepts, precepts are anyway, that we won't say anything bad about anyone unless nobody's listening. Looking, and then I can get away with it, you know? So. There is all this difference in perception. And the mind-only school came along and said, all of this is controlled by the mind. Now, I was very proud of Tom, too, because this lady was telling me this story, and Tom, too, was there. 
And she said, I don't understand that. She says, uh, I can't remember, I can't, I don't think I can quote you exactly. But she said something, well, he said everything was created by the mind. And we have a ceremony where there's a little, a little sentence, it's not a paragraph, it's a sentence, where the, the, the head monk announces that the mind creates all evil. So use the mind to eliminate evil. I don't know if anybody ever notices that when we do it. But all evil is created by the mind. It's not created by the body. It's not created by the universe. It's certainly not created by God, if you believe in, you know, some version of God. All evil is created by the mind. All good is created by the mind. And Tom too said something like, and I think she said, she said, what does that mean? You know, uh, the mind creates everything. And I think she said, well, it creates evil. I think, but I don't know. But she jumped right in there. She didn't even hesitate. She just, poof, it came out. And the gal, she never caught it. She never caught what she said. But that's okay. Because that, that fancy dress monk, he went away thinking he was special. And as we know, he was special, but he was also very ordinary. And that Zen monk would be the first one to tell you as he was eating his dinner, nothing special about me. I've met the Dalai Lama. Pretty impressive. I was impressed by the fact the size of his bodyguards. I never met him when he said I'm only a monk. But he got on my card, my dance card, when he said, people said, what is it like to be the most important Buddhist in the world? And he said, I'm not. I'm only a monk. And so we're only people, but we're terribly, terribly important as long as we remember. 